Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, State of the Art Advances in Upper Limb Amputee Rehabilitation and Prosthetics. Please note, the information presented by the expert is not used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation is merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law, saying the expert's consent, i.e. a business relationship where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Ms. Atkins will discuss advances in the industry, medical conditions and their impact, state-of-the-art arm prosthetics, ICO integration, pattern recognition, and cost. To give you a little background about our presenter, Diane Atkins is an occupational therapist specializing in upper limb amputee rehabilitation for the past 40 years. She has worked with over 2,000 children and adults with amputations and has lectured extensively throughout the U.S. and abroad in areas relating to the evaluation, treatment, training, and functional outcomes of individuals with unilateral and bilateral upper limb loss. Diane is an assistant professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. In advance of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, she was asked by the U.S. Surgeon General to present several courses for the clinical rehabilitation teams at Walter Reed and Brooke Army Medical Centers regarding the management and care of soldiers who have sustained upper limb loss. Attendees who require passcode, the word for today is LIM. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode in the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to the computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with the link to the archive recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the research list, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Diane, the presentation is now turned over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, our topic today is state-of-the-art advances in upper limb amputee rehabilitation and prostheses. And more specifically, how does this impact outcome, options, and costs where upper limb amputees are involved in litigation? Preparing a case with your upper limb prosthetics ex expert is particularly important. And these are just some of the critical elements to know and understand in order to maximize the outcome for your client. I won't go into detail. I understand you'll have these for your reference, but suffice it to say that each one of these impacts the individual's uh, ultimate independence, their overall costs, and their ability to be independent and potentially return to work. Now, these are uh, a sampling of some of the conditions that can impact the damages and overall outcome of a severe amputation injury. These could relate to upper or lower limb loss, and needless to say, there are many. Uh, some of the most common might include neuroma, fragile skin, uh, overuse syndrome, specifically in upper limb, overuse of the sound extremity. Some of the more serious would include brachial plexus injury that occurs when there's a traction or pull type um, experience of the individual at the time of trauma, being pulled out of a machine if they were pulled into something. Chronic pain is a major issue, as many of you are, I'm sure, are aware. Um, chronic can, pain can actually stop everything as it relates in the rehabilitation process. And then with that, an adverse um, and abuse of uh, prescription medicine can also be uh, a real issue. Um, clearly, the, the real um, cash driver in all of these is the cost of the prosthesis, and we'll be talking about that shortly. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware of the impairment ratings by the AMA. 
But I, uh, you'll probably find this interesting that um, the level of elbow disarticulation or wrist disarticulation, where many um, uh, losses occur, elbow disartic represents 95% upper limb impairment and 57% of the whole person. Um, loss of a hand is 90% upper limb impairment and 54% of the whole person. This, again, significantly impacts damages, obviously. When we look at the hand, the thumb is clearly the most important digit of the hand. Um, it represents 40% of hand impairment, 36% of upper limb impairment, and 22% of the entire person. Some of you may be familiar with this term or this visual but the homunculus is often used to demonstrate just how important the hand is as it relates to sensation and the importance of sensation in our bodies. Our lips and our hands utilize the most sensory neurons. Obviously, the loss represents a huge loss to all of us. This slide should actually read dramatic successes can be made by people who have lost one or both arms through the course of history and at various ages and various levels. Many of you will probably recognize this from the movie The Fugitive, Harrison Ford. Um, and this movie actually brought attention to the state of the art advances that were just beginning to occur in upper extremity prosthetic technology. Since then, however, a great deal more has occurred, which we'll be talking about today. You'll probably recognize Scott Pelley. I was actually um, uh, here at this um, particular venue um, when it was being filmed. Uh, the Department of Defense has invested a great deal of money in upper limb prosthetic technology, and this was taken when the DECA arm, also known as the Luke Skywalker arm, was being um, was being designed. And I was asked uh, to write the upper extremity training protocol for this arm. The eye limb hand. Um, came about and on the scene about 10 years ago, and it is and was the first multi-articulating hand for individuals who had lost their hand or part of their arm. It, it uh, Prior to this, the only hand, electric hand, had a tripod pinch, but the eye limb hand brought about six different prehensile patterns, as you can see, especially with the glove, the cosmetic glove that it has almost looks like a real hand. And the beauty of it is it also has a, a compliant grasp, which is uh, really very, very nice for the amputee. Um, ILIM and Touch Bionics also de uh, designed eye digits for the partial hand amputee. This particular woman I had the opportunity to work with actually in Scotland. She was a concert pianist um, from Barcelona, Spain, developed um, bacterial meningitis and uh, septicemia resulted and she lost part of both hands and her feet as well. Now, where did this all begin actually for me in my career? Um, the majority of my background is at the Institute for Rehabilitation in Houston, Texas. And interestingly enough, in the um, early 80s, uh, 90s. Um, Houston was in the midst and still is to a certain extent um, the heart of oil and gas and all that goes along with that industry, particularly as it relates to a building boom. And, um, and with that, electrical burn injuries were quite common. And the nature of electricity enters and exits the body and almost always more than one limb as, is involved. And as a result, in Houston at TIRR, we began to see a very large number of multiple um, limb amputees. Um, we became very quickly a center of excellence in amputee rehabilitation, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. 
<clears throat> just a little bit of historical background. Let's see here. Um, or um, actually, that first slide didn't come up, but it um, it was an individual using a body powered prosthesis. This is an example of a myoelectric user um, about 20 years ago. And this myoelectric hand uh, worked quite well, but it only had a tripod pinch. And myoelectrics, for those of you that aren't aware, basically um, consist of a, of a hand, an electric hand. The prosthetic socket slips on the residual limb, and there are myoelectrodes recessed within the wall of the socket that pick up the muscle contractions of the forearm, um, as in this particular gentleman. So when the residual wrist extensors contract, the hand opens, and when the residual wrist flexors contract, the hand closes. Now, there are a variety of different types of uh, terminal devices. What you see um, to your left is called a grifer. It's um, an electric hook that has grasping abilities up to about 40, 45 pounds of grip force. It also has the capability to hold very small items for fine motor prehension, as in holding a nail. And as you can see in the next slide, it can be used in pretty heavy duty um, activities as well. Um, activity specific um, devices can also be used for the amputee. And you see a couple examples here of, of um, Bob Rodosi. He's actually the prosthetist that designed some of these devices. And the photo on the left just shows a very simple attachment for the individual who wants to uh, use a camera. As an occupational therapist, I'm very involved in the holistic approach of, of the amputee and what really represents his quality of life um, other than simple independence or return to work. Uh, this one did not, I don't think you can see this one. Um, that was demonstrating proportional control with a prosthesis. Um, okay, this one um, exhibits two individuals who have above the elbow amputations. They were fit with an electric hand and an electric elbow. And suffice it to say, these folks can return to, to work um, in some pretty heavy duty um, uh, blue collar type jobs. This is an individual who was fit with um, a state of the art shoulder disarticulation prosthesis. And um, he is at this point, he was one of my patients, um, was actually taken in, um, in his home where we simulated several activities. He is completely independent with his shoulder disarticulation prosthesis. As I shared before, it's very important to look at the individual from a, a holistic approach, what's important to them other than work and independence at home. And uh, this slide demonstrates that very simply sometimes um, simple adaptations can be made to, um, for example, um, utilizing um, swim fins for um, swimming, obviously. And that was an important goal for this fellow who had lost both arms below the elbow and both legs below the knee. Based upon the experience that I've had, um, this slide was actually to show two textbooks that I've been fortunate to be involved in um, uh, both editing and um, being the author. The title, Comprehensive Management of the Upper Limb Amputee. When the up, upper um, limb or lower limb amputee um, is, is reviewed and, and seen in the medical setting, the team approach is critical, particularly for the amputee because so many aspects of their life are impacted. So it's clearly the physician, also the occupational therapist, the physical therapist, rehab nurse, social worker, and psychologist, and also the prosthetist.
<clears throat> just a uh, very important point to know. Essentially, all unilateral below and above elbow amputees have the ability to be totally independent in all their activities of daily living at the conclusion of their amputee rehabilitation program. Now, with that said, that does rely on excellent medical management, a skilled prosthetist, and skilled occupational therapy. There are very few occupational therapists in the United States that really have the expertise to work with amputees, particularly those who have been fit with um, advanced upper limb componentry. Now, the slide previous um, stated when all optimal conditions are present, but what associated medical conditions can significantly impact not being able to achieve an optimal outcome and independence? And as many of you know, individuals do not just sustain limb loss. Other things occur at the time of the injury as well. Traumatic brain injury obviously can impact their cognitive abilities. More than one limb amputated, as I shared, occurred in electrical burn injuries, auto accidents, machinery-related accidents. Multi-organ involvement is often something that I would see in many of these multi-trauma, severe catastrophic injuries. Brachial plexus injury is also very common in upper limb injury. The brachial plexus is a uh, uh, number of five different nerves that originate at the axilla underneath your arm. And in traction type injuries, when the arm is pulled or when there's direct injury to the shoulder, the brachial plexus can be involved. And that impacts sensation as well as peripheral nerve innervation to the muscles of the arm. Additionally, chronic pain is a huge factor in amputation injuries. Um, the associated abuse of prescription medication comes along with this. Neuromas. Neuroma is a small nerve knot, so to speak, at the end of the nerve that is cut or traumatized at the time of injury. And neuromas can sometimes form in amputations and they may cause severe pain, phantom pain, residual limb pain, and um, these can be problematic and often need to be removed. Heterotopic ossification is not unusual. When the bone is amputated, it still um, feels it has a need or wants to regenerate. So often at the time of amputation, um, bony overgrowth occurs, also known as heterotopic ossification. And when that occurs, these little nerve spikes really do um, present problems with pain and sometimes can actually poke through the skin, causing major difficulties and requiring revision. Scar tissue, if the injury has been burn-related or, again, major trauma where good tissue is not available, sometimes you have um, uh, skin defects and also um, uh, uh, skin uh, transfers that uh, plastic surgery speaking that um, need to cover the residual bone and this scar tissue can break down and poor skin coverage can also result in uh, uh, revision surgery being necessary. Right now, we have time for questions from any of you that I'd be happy to entertain. If not, we will proceed. Thanks, Diane. Any questions? If all the attendees could enter the passcode in for today, and if you have any questions for Diane, please enter them now also into the Q&A section. 
Also, please remember that if you're applying for CLE credit, you must attend for the full 60 minutes of this presentation. Our first question is, what is the most common cause of bilateral upper limb amputation? Okay, and as I shared, by far the most common cause is electrocution, electrical burn injury. Um, and I can also add that when I see someone with bilateral upper limb loss, I can almost always guess that they were a lineman uh, who were working in the bucket and they came in contact with a high powered line. And nine out of 10 times, that is what they will respond, but that is exactly what they were doing when they lost both arms. Another question? Can you name, can you name two recent advances that have been made in upper extremity prosthetics? Sure, and we're going to be talking about those shortly. Um, osseo integration is probably one of the more exciting ones that is actually direct skeletal attachment of the prosthesis to the bone. I'll be talking about that shortly. And uh, hand transplantation as well, and I'll be talking about that shortly. Another question? Another question is, what is a common issue that you have come across on a brachial plexus injury case? Well, brachial plexus injuries can, um, can create all different types of clinical pictures. Um, dependent upon where the brachial plexus was actually injured, if it is a complete nerve root avulsion, in other words, the brachial plexus was totally pulled out, of the spinal cord, um, then this results in a flaccid arm with no movement and no sensation. Those are clearly the most serious. And sometimes these individuals opt for amputation with a shoulder fusion because they can actually be much more functional with a prosthesis. If it's a partial brachial plexus injury, this results in some of the nerves being spared, but not all of them. So you can maybe have elbow flexion and a little bit of hand motion, um, but not a true functioning um, extremity. The other phenomenon that comes with brachial plexus injuries is significant pain. So these challenges really do um, create problems for the rehabilitation team and for the patient. Can a, a, uni, a unilateral above or below elbow amputee fit with a body-powered or electric prosthesis be independent? Yes, they actually can. As I was sharing in the previous slide, um, those with a body-powered cable-controlled prosthesis um, can be independent. This, in many instances, for the individual who is returning to a job that is um, back on a farm, a ranch, machine-related, uh, they don't want an electric arm because an electric arm uh, can break down, um, it can have maintenance issues, and can be a hassle sometimes. And so something that is consistently going to be operational for them and reliable is the body-powered prosthesis, the cable-controlled. So again, with good medical management, prosthetic uh, expertise, and occupational training, occupational therapy training, yes, these individuals can be independent. Our next question is, what are some of the associated medical conditions that can impact optimal outcomes for the upper limb amputee? Well, the, these were listed in the previous slide that I, um, that I had before. Um, just to expand on those a little bit more, uh, delayed wound healing, joint contracture, abnormal sensation. There can be cardiac compromise, particularly in electrical burn injuries. Even um, post-electrical burn cataracts can also be an issue. Um, 
impaired reasoning and judgment, cognitive issues if there's a traumatic brain injury, uh, neuropathy, sleep disorder, or PTSD are also not unusual at all with amputations. Sometimes, and actually quite often, these individuals still experience the trauma of the injury in a nightmare, um, or it could even occur in the middle of the day. Uh, many times, if they return back to the scene of the injury or the work site, they have a real um, anxiety attack and very bad feelings about being there. Um, arthritis, chronic pain, uh, alcohol abuse, altered self-image, depression, all of these can definitely enter in to the amputee experience and obviously impact the outcome and impact damages. Our last question, can a cable control body power prosthesis fit with a hook terminal device? be functional for someone missing both arms? Yes, absolutely. In fact, it's not unusual um, for an individual with bilateral upper limb loss, particularly when that loss is below the elbow, to actually choose to be independent with a body-powered prosthesis with bilateral hooks. Because again, they're dependent, they're, um, they are reliable, they don't break down, the amputee actually feels a kinesthetic feedback through the cables that they don't get with electric components. So there are clear indications for body-powered prostheses. Thanks so much, Diane. You can continue with the presentation. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, what are some of the latest advances? Um, as already, um, discussed, uh, electric multi-articulating hands and digits have made a huge impact in the field. And with that, as you might suspect, comes a significant increase in cost. And we'll be talking about that shortly. Osseo integration, direct skeletal attachment, I'll cover in a couple of minutes with a little bit more detail. Sensory feedback is another area of significant interest, as you might suspect, with implantable myoelectrode or myoelectric sensors. This is still in the R&D phase, but um, it's happening quickly, and I think we're soon going to be seeing sensation to a certain extent being available in these prostheses. Targeted muscle re I'll describe shortly. Pattern recognition, and last but not least, hand transplantation which is an area of um, significant interest to me as I've been in, um, involved in a uh, very unique research uh, study involving outcomes with hand transplants and uh, amputee users. Now, electric multi-articulating hands, um, this is actually a video, but um, not able to be shown to you, but this fellow with bilateral transradial, meaning below the elbow amputations, fit with eye limb quantum hands, they're multi-articulating hands, he is demonstrating opening a Coke can completely without assistance with his hands. These multi-articulating hands have individually powered digits. Each finger has multi-articulations at the IP joints. There is a rotatable thumb um, that is electric to help um, uh, be compliant in grasping abilities. Non-back drivable digits, mean, meaning once it's grasping something, the digits do not return back. They're locked into position and various grasping possibilities. For the partial hand, these have just become available within the last three years, and the partial hand amputations are actually the most common amputation that you see. And for them, up until now, there have been very, very few alternatives. But now they do have a very excellent alternative, um, the eye digit with, again, articulating digits 
that are with a manually rotatable thumb, if the thumb is also missing. These digits can be fit to a hand that has one, two, three, four, or five digits missing. Um, the eye digits have a compliant grip, a very grip feature, which gives them proportional control in the ability to grasp. They have a slip detection feature so that once they're holding on to a glass, for example, um, the hand will hold on to that. You don't have to sustain the contraction of your, uh, of your muscle to hold that glass. And there are a series of grip patterns and gestures that can be built into the software that will enable the uh, eye digit hand or eye limb hand to go into a variety of, of grasping patterns. Osseo integration. This is the surgical alternative that's available when prosthetic sockets and suspension, meaning harnesses, often fail to meet the cosmetic and functional requirements of the individual. So osseo integration um, is really an exciting um, advance. Um, it has gone through a number of uh, changes in the last several years, and this direct bone anchorage allows the prosthesis to be attached directly to the residual limb. So in the photograph that you see, there's an abutment, a screw that actually projects, but the, uh, the actual hardware of the osseo-integrated prosthesis is in the humerus. So there's no harness that's required and excellent range of motion can be achieved. Osseo integration is based on the principle that has been used clinically for tooth implants and also maxillofacial replacement since 1965. The sensory feedback, interestingly enough, is reported to be improved because of a phenomenon known as osseoperception. The benefits of this, you have a less feeling of weight, there's more control over the prosthesis, there is no perspiration per se, which is a huge issue for many individuals wearing sockets. Pain is reduced. Tissue breakdown that comes from an external socket is eliminated. You don't need to um, go back to the prosthetist for uh, additional sockets. It's easier to don and doff. It actually takes just a half turn of an Allen wrench to take on and off. And then again, the osseo perception allows the um, amputee to really feel that the limb is part of their body. Now, the challenges that I've listed below are actually um, no longer um, as prolonged. There is now a surgery that has been perfected in Australia, soon to be FDA approved in the United States. That's just one procedure. Um, it where a two-stage uh, procedure was required in the past, um, extending over 18 months, this procedure now can be accomplished and have the, the amputee walking, as in a lower limb amputee, or using an upper limb amputee, uh, prosthesis in four to six weeks. And although infection can be a problem, it's not as much of an issue as it has been in the past. So I think we in the United States are going to see um, much more of this in the near future once FDA approved. Sensory feedback is another innovation that is somewhat the holy grail in um, as it relates to prostheses. Um, needless to say, all of us take um, sensation um, for granted, but there is um, research and development going on that is allowing the amputee through their residual limb to feel pressure sensation, hot and cold, um, tactile discrimination as far as rough and smooth surfaces is going to probably come later, but it's a very exciting development that's going on right now. Right now, it is not... Um, Available for purchase, it's still in the R&D phase. And the myoelectric implant will de detect muscle signals for control of the prosthesis. And 
an implantable neurostimulator will activate the peripheral nerves to actually restore sensation. Targeted muscle reinnervation. This is a very exciting surgical development that came about at the Rehab Institute of Chicago. It's been um, in existence for about the last, I'd say, seven years. It's been um, perfected to the point where in high levels of limb loss at the above elbow or shoulder disarticulation, where there are still residual nerves that exist in, in the trunk, these nerves can often be um, moved, the various, various branches of these nerves can be moved and transplanted or transferred to the residual limb, to the biceps and triceps, for example. And the muscles then act as a biological amplifier of the motor command. The advantages are that now we have more control signals for the control of the various degrees of freedom of the prosthesis. So suddenly when you have a high limb loss, you have much easier control of the elbow, of the forearm, the wrist, and of the hand, and it's much more intuitive. So the advantages are great because for these folks who have lost their arm at a high level, they now have greater range of motion and they have more control options to utilize their electric arm. Pattern recognition is exciting as well. In the past, one muscle contraction operated one degree of freedom. So in other words, when the biceps contracted, the myoelectrode would sense that contraction, and in turn, the electric arm would flex at the elbow. When the triceps would contract, the arm would extend. But if you would want more intuitive control and more spontaneous um, control of the arm that includes the entire arm moving at the same time, pattern recognition offers that. So there's no mode switching, which means that you don't have to first position the elbow in space before you go to operate the forearm, and then you go to operate the uh, wrist, and then the hand or the hook. So it's much more patterned and controlled in a very smooth and fluid manner. You have better proportional control meaning the arm doesn't move too quickly or too slowly. Your muscle response does not have to be as robust because in many trauma cases, you don't have a strong myoelectric um, response of that muscle. And in many instances, with some of the brighter and more um, intuitive uh, amputees, they can calibrate the pattern recognition on their own. So this too is a wonderful advance. It is specifically indicated for individuals who have poor myocytes, in other words, very poor and weak muscles, or unbalanced myo signals, and users that have difficulty with mode switching. So in other words, going from biceps to triceps isolation. It has increased potential for many myoelectric users, and particularly for those that couldn't be fit with traditional myoelectric prostheses beforehand. Okay, and probably the most exciting um, development is hand transplantation. And this is an area that I've been involved more recently in looking at the outcomes of individuals that have had hand transplants, unilateral and more important, bilateral. This is really where this uh, procedure is indicated. Um, there have been about 100 hand transplants performed um, in the United States and internationally. I've been fortunate to be um, able to meet several of these individuals in this research study. And I've been looking specifically at the outcomes from a, a quantitative perspective. In other words, how functional these folks are 
And what is their quality of life compared to those who have been fit with electric multi-articulating hands? And it's been very interesting. And actually, it, um, these are two videos um, that are not running right now, but demonstrate the, the abilities of these folks. The woman on the left and right um, is a bilateral hand transplant that received her transplants at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And she, to this day, has returned to work and is completely independent. The major disadvantage of hand transplantation is lifelong immunosuppression, which is a major issue. There's a great deal of research um, at Johns Hopkins specifically looking at how this can be reduced because immunosuppression obviously sets the patient up for some real problems that um, can result from your body not being able to ward off um, disease. And um, you will almost always have at least one acute rejection episode with your hands because clearly you're using the hands from someone else, as well as complications um, that in some instances could be cancer um, and any number of other diseases that can um, come about with lifelong immunosuppression. In my opinion, it is not indicated for unilateral limb loss, although it has been performed with those who have just one arm missing. Now, let's talk about the costs for for um, not only this procedure, but uh, some of the prostheses that we've been talking about. These are approximate only. Very often, they're dependent upon the prosthetist skills of the prosthetist and the components that are involved. But the partial hand prosthesis that is just activity specific, in other words, just a simple device for someone who's lost part of their hand or one or two or more digits, five to $10,000. If that partial hand um, is fit with a functional aesthetic, also known as a cosmetic or passive prosthesis, you're looking at a little bit more. But these can be very, very, um, uh, real looking, very cosmetic, and run in the neighborhood of twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars. If the individual is fit with alt electric multi-articulating eye digits, you see the bounce. You see the clear difference in cost: ninety to as much as one hundred and forty thousand dollars. The individual um, has the transradio level of loss, body powered, very simple cable and hook: forty to fifty thousand dollars or less, to be quite honest. An electric hand, then you're upping it significantly. But that's the electric hand that's more the traditional. Just with the three-jaw three, uh, three chuck, it's known as the tripod pinch. As soon as we're looking the, at a complete electric multi-articulating hand attached to a below-elbow prosthesis, without, say, a cosmetic glove, you're looking at sixty to eighty-five to potentially 100000 Above the elbow or transhumeral level of amputation, if they're fit with an all-body-powered cable-controlled with a hook or a cable-controlled hand, forty to $60,000. A hybrid prosthesis, meaning that it could be a body-powered elbow, electric hand, or the reverse, electric elbow, body-powered hand, could be in the neighborhood of seventy dollars to $100,000. If that above elbow amputee is fit with a complete electric prosthesis with hand, elbow, and possibly a wrist rotator, you're looking at $150,000 to $180,000. Now, with all of this said, this is where the role of the expert really comes into play for all of you, be you plaintiff or defense, because needless to say, each amputee is different in what is indicated for them. Functionally, as it relates to return to work or their psychological needs to be fit with more of a cosmetic prosthesis. Ideally, if the amputee can be fit with both a body powered and an electric arm, that is what um, is the ideal. Now, if someone has lost their arm at the shoulder, but there is not a great deal of function, even if they're fit with an electric arm. So many of them opt for just a passive aesthetic arm, which is between forty and fifty thousand dollars. If they're fit with a complete electric arm, 
and a cosmetic glove, you're looking at one hundred and sixty to one hundred and ninety thousand uh, dollars. When you're looking at the life care plan for these folks, the frequency of the replacement of a prosthesis, dependent upon use, is anywhere from five to seven years, and the yearly maintenance of a prosthesis is approximately ten percent of co the cost. But these numbers are helpful when you're working with a life care planner. Hand transplantation, approximately $500 to $800,000 for the first year of this procedure. Um, many of these procedures actually have been underwritten for some of these um, initial cases by the university where they were being done um, so these surgeons could learn how to do them. Incidentally, up to 18 surgeons are required for a hand transplant because of all of the um, many um, issues within the hand transplant, um, not only the bone, but also the nerves, circulation system, the skin. So we're looking at a major, major procedure. Following the first year, um, and what I didn't mention, that following hand transplantation, occupational therapy is required six to seven hours a day, six to seven days a week for a year to 18 months, which is a huge requirement of the amputee and the medical center where the transplant occurs. So often these folks actually have to move to where the center of excellence is. So hand therapy is ongoing after the first year. Rejections may require hospitalization and lifelong immunosuppression. I must admit, even though um, the uh, the realities of, of transplantation are what I just um, reviewed with you, every individual that I have had the opportunity to meet, interview, and evaluate have absolutely no regrets, and they are very, very pleased with their hands, their new hands. Okay, yeah, we're coming to the end now um, and a time for your questions. And this slide is really just to share with you that we are just really on the threshold of many of these advances. Um, I've been fortunate in my career to be a part of many of them. And I'm exciting, excited with what is coming down the pike. Um, let me just share a couple cases with you. Um, unilateral partial hand amputation. Um, this is a case that I had, 43-year-old, right dominant female retail worker. She was injured on the job. She was trying to clear out um, a jammed carton baler. Her right hand was caught, crushed in the machine. She attempted to pull it out. While trying to reopen the machine, her arm was pulled hard in again at the shoulder when she tried to extract it. Um, she was able to get the machine open, but it closed back on her hand, and it resulted in a very mangled hand, uh, not able to be replanted or salvaged. She was taken to a local hospital for local care, and uh, she's retained an attorney. She wants a hand like the one she lost. She wants to be able to return to work. Uh, since discharge from the hospital, she, she's become very dependent upon her husband and for the majority of, of her ADL. So knowing this, um, you've decided to take the case, but what are some of the important issues about this case that you and your expert need to address? Well, needless to say, we need to look at some of the long-term complications that were included in the slide previously that will impact her ability to be independent and return to work. We need to look at the type of work and is it even possible for her to go back to that? Um, what's her current level of independence? Does she need attendant care? What's her level of pain? Does she have PTSD? And some, what are the long and short-term effects physically and psychologically for this woman? Um, I must admit the partial hand amputees that I work have worked with have significant psychological issues as well as functional. 
um, that relate to self-image, Im impact on sexuality and relationship with their significant other. Overuse syndrome to the sound hand and arm is also a factor to, to uh, consider. Another case, one uh, unilateral below elbow amputee, 60-year-old right-hand dominant male reached into a metal rolling machine March of this past year, cleared debris from the metal being processed. His left arm was pulled in and crushed as a result. The damage was severe up to the level of the shoulder. However, it only resulted in a below elbow amputation. Prior to the injury, also very important to look at, his hobbies included hunting, fishing, and spending time with his grandchildren. He returned, retained an attorney. He wants two prostheses, if not more, one to help him resume, resume to work um, on his farm. He wants to look and function uh, with an arm that um, it was like what he lost. He wants also to be able to hold a fishing rod and also one that helps him hold a camera. So are these expectations realistic and what would they cost? Yes, they are realistic and these are some of the costs. What are the maintenance um, uh, issues over the life care plan? We've already talked about those. What are some of the extenuating circumstances that can add to the overall life care plan? Heterotopic ossification, neuroma, soft tissue revision, and perhaps um, residual limb revision if there's poor soft tissue coverage. The most extreme case example, bilateral shoulder disarticulation and or above, um, above amputations. Uh, this individual is a 55-year-old right-hand dominant Caucasian male lineman, which again, as I shared, if you see someone with both arms missing, they probably were a lineman. He sustained high voltage electrical burn injury in August. This is an actual case last year. He was in a utility bucket, working on a power line, came in contact with 14,000 volts of electricity. He lives with his wife and, as you might suspect, is experiencing major depression. He's retained you as his attorney, wants to know that he has the best representation possible to get all that he can in order to live without needing to be dependent upon someone for the rest of his life. So that's a high, high bar, and that's quite frankly going to be very difficult for him. So as you prepare your case, what are the questions to ask to be certain that you have the best upper extremity rehabilitation expert to assist you in this case? So you want to ask them, how much experience do they have in working specifically, not just with the amputee, but with bilateral upper extremity amputees? It's essential and critical in being able to manage this complex of a case. And quite frankly, there are only three to four major centers of excellence in the United States with the expertise to treat electrical burn injuries that result in multiple amputations. And there are less than 10 occupational therapists in the United States with expertise in training someone with this complex of an injury. Where has this experience been? And you're asking your expert, and what would you expect someone with this level of amputation to be able to do as it relates to using a prosthesis? So ask your expert this. This is a good way to find out just how experienced she or he is. So someone with these levels of amputation will probably be able to function with only one prosthesis because they're so complex but clearly deserves the opportunity to be fit with both. Each prosthesis could cost anywhere between $150,000 and $200,000. Function would be extremely limited, and the individual re would require more than likely a full-time attendant care for the majority of his or her life. Okay, some of the extenuating medical conditions specifically that follow electrical burn injuries, they have a lot going on. Cardiac issues, cognitive, hypertrophic scarring, phantom pain, 
which is the feeling that the arm is still there. Chronic pain is not unusual. Sexual dysfunction, post-electrical <clears throat> burn cataracts, skin breakdown from adherent scar tissue. They do not tolerate um, temperature change very well. So very cold or very hot environments are a real problem. Skin breakdown from adherent scar tissue from the skin graft. HO, altered self-image. Neuroma formation, as we discussed before. Anxiety disorder, PTSD. Impaired balance, because obviously they've lost both arms, so they're prone to falling. Depression, abnormal sensation, meaning it can be either with out sensation over certain portions of their body where the electricity exited. Even, even though they have both arms missing, the which is severe in itself, but the electricity had to exit somewhere else. That could be on their abdomen or out through the bottom of their feet or through their thighs. So there are issues going on there with sensation and skin issues. Joint contractures can occur very easily if there's a little bit of the humerus that remains, and depression. So I thank you, and we have, I believe, a couple minutes for any questions. Thanks, Diane. Our first question is, what is the most common issue you have encountered as an expert in a brachial plexus injury case on a child uh, caused during childbirth? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And brachial plexus injuries are quite often um, with a child. And again, as I was describing before, a lot depends on where um, within the body, within the brachial plexus, um, the trauma happened. So quite frankly, the most severe form of a brachial plexus injury for a child is the flaccid limb. And that's a limb that simply is non-functional. It may have a little bit of elbow flexion, but more than likely you don't have hand or wrist ability. So you're looking at many issues. Sometimes joint contracture can occur. So these kids really do have issues. Now, the good news is some of these brachial plexus injuries can resolve, can improve. Um, if they happened at childbirth. But that, again, takes a center of excellence and very good occupational therapy to work with these kids on a regular basis. Can a prosthesis for a partial hand amputee cost over $100,000? Yeah, believe it or not, it can. Um, if it's a five-digit system, uh, so in other words, if just the palm remains, and all digits are missing. They're fit with a, an I-digit prosthesis with a cosmetic, a very high-end, and there are different degrees that you can get, high-end cosmetic cover. But some of them actually include um, hair and veins, and the coloring is can be exactly um, uh, similar to the sound hand. And so, yeah, you're looking at a very high-end prosthesis, but let me also say that this requires a very skilled prosthetist, and dependent upon the prosthetist, the price can fluctuate significantly. So there's a great deal of variation within what these prosthetists will charge, but many of them go um, to the high-end for obvious reasons, because each one of these is custom made. Can you uh, name three advances in upper limb amputee rehabilitation and or technology? Well, I think I've pretty much covered those. Um, Multi-articulating hands, osteointegration, um, pattern recognition, um, sensory, um, sensory implants, the implantable myoelectrodes, um, as I shared, they are not available now, but probably will be in the near future. I've pretty much covered them um, in this talk. Um, others are, are coming down the, the pike, but they're probably variations of what I've already described and uh, opportunities to make them that much better. And last question. 
Can a prosthesis, uh, is it possible to attach a prosthesis to a bone in order to, to, to suspend the prosthesis? Yes, absolutely. That's osseointegration. That's exactly what it is, which is a very exciting advance. Thank you so much, Diane, for presenting this presentation today. In addition You're welcome. to being your Thank best you. In addition for, to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for the past 60 years, PASA also offers e-discovery and forensic solutions, free interactive webinars, day in the life videos, research reports on experts such as the Challenge History Report 2.0, preliminary screening report, and the Expert Profile 360. Just a quick reminder that please remember that if you're applying for CLE credit, you must attend for the full 60 minutes of this presentation. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. I just want to thank, take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending, and most especially Diane Atkins for her time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Diane, or if you would like to speak with a task of representative regarding an expert witness for a case you are currently working on, please contact TASA at 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's, on today's presentation. Again, thank you for attending. This concludes our presentation for today.